What I want to do in this video is to talk about Moore's Utopia, uh, which is a book, and um, and it was written <clears throat> right about the same time as *In Praise of Folly* uh, by Erasmus and Machia Machiavelli's *The Prince*, and they have some similarities that I want to talk about. And then Moore <clears throat> talks about a, a, a particular issue that's happening as feudalism is falling apart and and um, that phenomenon is very important to the story of marxism uh, about how we get from feudalism to capitalism and so let's get to it uh, let me share my screen i'll share this okay and so at the <clears throat> as as the feudal order is pretty much over by about 1500 um there's you know a lot of criticism of the church and criticism of old feudal ways of doing things and that that's an indication that that things the feudal order has fallen apart and then you know people are talking about doing things differently or even just describing the way that things are being in fact done differently uh, in this time period and criticizing not only the old feudal order but also what has replaced it um so there's a new money economy uh and so in in my lecture about the crisis of the late middle medieval period uh i talked about that okay and <clears throat> one thing that we should uh, note too is that uh, columbus invaded the Americas in 1492 and immediately within years the Spanish Empire begins to extract gold and silver from the Americas on a grand scale and bring that gold and silver back to Europe and they're minting coin coinage and so that really boosts the already uh, money economy that's already existing it just infuses it with a bunch of new money um, so that we really are transitioning away from the feudal order where everything's based on land um, and more and more even uh, nobles lords that hold land in tenure through vassalage to some higher higher lord um rather than pay rather than you know it being a relationship where the lord the vassal contributes military service to the lord um instead they just start paying money so they just pay rent uh for their uh, landlordship and and then that goes all the way down to where many um, uh, you have freeholders you have uh, people that would otherwise be serfs who are paying rent on a small plot of land uh, and they're paying in money and, and then they're free to do with their land with whatever whatever they want um, they just got to always pay the rent to to the lord uh, to the landlord and um, they're no longer serfs you know there's the whole the whole system of serfdom is is uh disappearing but still existing in some places i mean serfdom existed all the way up into the 20th century in russia okay but russia you know is a little distinct from the rest of europe sometimes uh, you know it uh, at, for long periods of time it wasn't considered part of Europe um, but we tend to think of it as European now um, but all the way up until the 20th century so right before the Russian Revolution in 1917 there were still serfs okay 
uh, and that was happening in other places as well uh, around Europe, <clears throat> but just here and there, pockets. Um, we also should be aware that you know global sea trade is um, is present for the first time in world history. And again, this has a lot to do with the Spanish conquest of the Americas because uh, Christopher Columbus showed that you know you could you could just go out over the open ocean and uh, navigate safely. And so immediately people get begin sailing all over the world, even to the far east, um, going around Africa and you know, going the other direction and that means that globalization uh, is beginning to take hold. And one of the key industrial centers at this time uh, is uh, the Netherlands and, and the Dutch uh, are focused, you know, their big industry that is pretty prevalent throughout the entire region is textiles. And what they do is they get raw materials uh, from uh, all over the world, really. Um, and the raw material for textiles is wool. And so uh, that becomes important in, in this story here that I'm going to tell. Um, and so they, the Dutch have a high demand for wool because they're just producing textiles and then they're shipping those textiles all over the world and flooding the global market with uh, manufactured textiles um, in a and in something a quasi factory sort of um, uh, industrial system. Not fully what we'd call factories yet. Uh, that doesn't happen until the 18th century and the 1700s. Uh, but the the seeds of, of factory uh, manufacture are are there and they're doing a booming business and shipping this stuff all over the world and um, flooding the market with very cheap textiles and so they're cornering the world market in textiles and they need more and more wool they, they're just running out of wool to to make enough uh, for the demand that they have okay um i I wanted to so compare um, these three works uh, in praise of folly, the prince, and Moore's Utopia, uh, which is the full title is a little true book, not less beneficial than enjoyable on the best state of a republic and on the new island of Utopia. Okay. Um, so he, he's talking about the best state. Okay, that's that's uh, interesting, and the prince is also about how to uh, govern, how a prince governs the state best, and uh, in praise of folly. Now, uh, let, let's take a look at the Wikipedia page on this. Um, and uh, let's see, I, so he wrote this while he was visiting Moore in London. So Erasmus is a friend of Moore's and they, you know, Erasmus went to vacation uh, with Moore at his home. And, um, and during that visit, you know, he wrote this, this little book and um, what, the title in Latin, so it was written in Latin, uh, but Morier Encomium, uh, that can be translated as in praise of folly, or it could be translated as in praise of more. Um, and so, uh, you know, it has that, that double meaning. And I think here they say that it even has a triple meaning, um, but you can, you can look at that. But uh, the connection to more is, is very important. And the content is this uh in praise of folly begins with a satirical learned enconium uh encomium in which folly praises herself so folly is personified as a goddess 
in the manner of a Greek satirist, um, the Greek satirist Lucian whose work Erasmus and Sir Thomas More had recently translated into Latin. It then takes a darker tone in a series of orations as Folly praises self-deception, madness, and moves to a satirical examination of pious but superstitious abuses of Catholic doctrine and the corrupt practices in parts of the Roman Catholic Church, to which Erasmus was uh, ever faithful, and the folly of pedants. Okay. And uh, you can look at pedants, a person who excessively is excessively concerned with formalism, accuracy, and precision. Um, one who makes a show of learning, you know, not actually learned, but sort of pretends to be smarter than they are, and is sort of uh, wrapped up with technicalities, um, which is which is. Uh, that's the difference between sort of scholasticism and this um, scholastic medieval way of thinking, always being always being concerned about uh, proving doctrine correct, like um, Thomas Aquinas, versus humanism, where it isn't so, it isn't as important to be, to be, technically accurate according to the group think uh, of the Roman Catholic Church for one, uh, but also just other scholars, you know, and always worrying about saying the right thing. Uh, for humanists, it's about really delving the depths of human experience and being eloquent and creative and have a sense of humor and, and really think about life and all of its richness and not be so uh, narrow-minded. And so, you know, and that's what we call the Renaissance, is that humanism comes along and makes people more open-minded. And of course, um, the printing press, you know, had a lot to do with that because more and more people are becoming somewhat educated, just like a general education, just like we're doing at Cerritos College. You know, you're not uh, necessarily the, the greatest intellect or or doing sophisticated research, but you're getting generally educated and knowing more and more about the world and other human experiences. Uh, so Erasmus had recently returned um, disappointed from Rome where he had turned down offers of advancement in the Curia, um, in the higher orders of, of the Roman Catholic Church. And Folly, uh, personified as a goddess, increasingly takes on Erasmus's own chastising voice. Okay, uh, the essay ends with a straightforward statement of Christian of the Christian ideal: "No man is wise at all times, or is without his blind side." Okay, no man is wise at all times. Uh, that's very tied in with the Socratic uh, notion of philosophy, the wisdom of Socrates. Um, as is made clear throughout the Platonic uh, works. So Plato's you know, full works were now available because of Cosimo de' Medici. Um, and so this notion of wisdom as knowing that you're not wise uh, is, is uh, part of this humanist turn. And Erasmus is very much tied into that. Um, so again, Socrates, in the Platonic dialogues, Socrates is always telling people, well, I don't know, but you seem to know. So let me ask you some questions and let's find out what you really know. Uh, and then of course he always shows that they don't know what they think they know, okay? Uh, but he never claims to know the things that they don't know. He always claims to not know. And that's why he's wise because he knows that he doesn't know where other people think that they know something that they don't actually know, and that's not so wise. Um, okay, so, so here we see the, uh, the influence of a genuine uh, Platonism, okay? And uh, again, thanks to the printing press and, and, uh, and, and the accumulated money wealth of Cosimo de' Medici, okay? But um, the thing I want to emphasize here is that we have folly 
praising herself and praising self-deception and madness, things that are not praiseworthy. It's satirical. It's ironic. And, um, and, and that's the point. Okay. Um, the Prince, so by Machiavelli. Um, this is about, this is a, 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 a book, uh, literally, um, dedicated to uh, one of the Medici's, um, Lorenzo de' Medici, Duke of um, uh, Urbino. Um, so here we have one of the Medici's who's actually now has the title of Duke in the feudal order, but that was not because of their long history of, um, of nobility. It's just because they were bankers and got enough money and then bought a fiefdom, right? <laughs> um, and so here you have, in, in the Medicis, you have um, a, a clear example of the breakdown of the feudal order. And they're not, they're not paying for their, uh, you know, Lorenzo is not paying for his duchy uh, in, in military service. He's just paying for it with money. And, and you know, it's purely a monetary transaction. Um, and so the book is dedicated to Lorenzo and addressed to him or maybe to one of his sons um, that is going to take over the the uh, duchy or become some lord in another fiefdom and so this is like a manual of how, how do you be a prince especially a prince who's maybe acquiring new land and has to establish uh, their legitimacy and so the advice that Machiavelli gives is just be super ruthless, just be cynical, don't care about the people, just manipulate them in every possible way, and um, and and just have no scruples. Um, if you're familiar with like the the TV show that's out right now called Succession. Uh, you know, it's about a family <clears throat> that owns a media empire and um, the father is one of, he's like just super ruthless and doesn't care about ethics and, um, you know, will just take every advantage he can, even to the extent that he doesn't care about his children in, in a fatherly way. He just manipulates them and is trying to mold, trying to figure out which one of them he can mold into his own image of being just a jerk. Um, and so, you know, uh, the prince feels the same, has that same sort of feeling, but it's, it's expressed as if it's sincere, but it seems that it's satirical, just like in Praise of Folly was. And so there is a, um, and this is a standard interpretation, and this is the way that I read it. To me, it doesn't, it doesn't seem sincere. It seems entirely satirical. Um, so as satire, uh, this was um, made famous by um, Mattingly, okay, in the 50s, but even Diderot, uh, and Diderot's from uh, the 18th century, um, the, the first encyclopedias uh, were, the first encyclopedia uh, was largely, uh, had large contributions from, from Diderot. Um, he, he read The Prince as satirical. And, and then here's what <clears throat> Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, had to say about Machiavelli. Machiavelli was a proper man and a good citizen, but being attached to the court of the Medici, he could not help availing his love of liberty in the midst of his country's oppression. The choice of his detestable hero, uh, Cesar Borgia, who was a ruthless prince, okay, and so he, Machiavelli uses that as a, a key example, 
clear enough, clear enough uh, this example shows his hidden aim and the contradiction between the teaching of the prince and that of the discourses on Livy and the history of Florence. Um, those are other books that Machiavelli wrote. And so the dis discord here shows that his profound, this profound political thinker has so far been studied only uh, by superficial or corrupt readers. People are not reading properly. The court of Rome sternly prohibited his book. I can believe well, I can well believe it, for it is that court it most clearly portrays. Okay, the, and the court of Rome, of course, is the papal court. Um, and so it's, it's a book written to a Medici who's not really part of the feudal order. The papacy is part of the feudal order. Um, but uh, it ulti what Rousseau is saying here is that, is that it's comparing the papacy to the Medici and, and saying, well, they're doing the same thing. And they're all ruthless and, and, and uh, unconcerned with uh, human interest. Uh, Oh, and so, and then there's this final thought, whether or not the word satire is the best choice, the interpretation is very rare amongst those who study Machiavelli's works. For example, uh, Isaiah Ber Berlin uh, states that he can't find anything other than Machiavelli's work that reads less like a satirical piece. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, so there will be people who disagree, but, um, but it, it, it does suggest that it is satirical, uh, you know, in, in its own terms, it, it's like, are you being serious? Or are you being satirical? And maybe it's a little ambiguous on purpose. I mean, that's part of the artistry of the work. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so it fits in with the literary style of the time, like in Praise of Folly, which is clearly a satirical work, but the prince is a little more nuanced, okay? Um, now, a, a more recent interpretation, and this is pretty interesting, is by uh, Mary Dietz uh, in her essay, Trapping the Prince. And I haven't read this, but I, I just saw this on Wikipedia, and I think it's interesting, so this is something to, to look at. Uh, and, and we'll see we'll see later why the prince is important for the philosophy of liberation because um, the way that Latin America was run was very much in the model of the prince, and um, and and so the conquistadors um, had a particular form of feudalism that they imposed on uh, Latin America. Uh, but it wasn't the old feudalism. It's this new feudalism, um, almost like a, a false feudalism, a, a pretend feudalism that's just super ruthless. And um, and so, you know, it's almost like Latin American uh, feudal lords were reading the prince very literally. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, she writes that Machiavelli's agenda was not to be satirical, as Rousseau. Rousseau, I'd argue, but instead was offering carefully crafted advice, such as arming the people, uh, designed to undo the ruler if taken seriously and followed. So it's like a poison pill where Machiavelli's saying, oh yeah, follow this advice. It'll, it'll, it'll be great. It'll all work out good. Uh, where in fact, his advice is designed to undo uh, the prince, if if they really followed the advice. By this account, the aim was to reestablish the Republic in Florence. Uh, she focuses on three categories in which Machiavelli gives paradoxical advice. He discourages liberty and favors deceit to guarantee support uh, from the people. Yet Machiavelli is keenly aware of the fact that an earlier pro-Republican coup had been thwarted by the people's inaction that itself stemmed from the prince's liberality. So, uh, you know, 
if you if you actually give the people what they want, then they're not going to rebel. Uh, but the advice in the prince is exactly the opposite. Um, he supports arming the people, despite the fact that he knows the Florentines are decidedly pro-democratic and would oppose the prince. So if you arm the people at some point, especially if you're treating them poorly and arming them, you know, there's going to be a revolution. Uh, he encourages the prince to live in the city he conquers. Um, and so move into the city rather than, uh, you know, staying detached and then you're right in the midst of the people where they can attack you um, and this opposes the medici's habitual policy of living outside of the city it also makes it easier for the rebels or a civilian militia to attack and overthrow the prince okay um, according to deeds the trap never succeeded because lorenzo de medici a suspicious prince apparently never read the work of the former Republican, the so-called former Republican, right? <clears throat> because in his other works, Machiavelli is clearly of uh, a, a, a Republican bent, which means that you have some kind of democratic um, participation of the population, and it's not a monarchy. It's distinct from monarchy. That's what republic means here. Um, okay, so All right, so that's that, okay. Okay, so, so we have these two works. One is clearly satirical, one is ambiguously satirical and maybe just, you know, giving bad advice on purpose uh, in a kind of devious way. Uh, but there's something going on there in, in the prints that's that's not uh, just what it presents itself to be at face value. And then we have uh, Moore's Utopia, and and um, all of these books were hugely popular. You know, from you know <laughs> as much as a book is going to be popular, um, but you know people didn't have a lot of options for entertainment. Um, uh, and literacy was growing, and you know, so um, it, it certainly made a cultural impact. And people talked about these books, maybe if they didn't exactly entirely read them, they at least were aware of them. And um, <clears throat> uh, and and these are all. Also, I should mention that these are all published or written. The Prince didn't get published until like 1532 or something like that, but it was circulating in manuscript form before that. Uh, and they were, these works were all written within a few years of each other. <clears throat> so there's some a kind of zeitgeist, a kind of spirit of the age um, that they all, you know, exemplify. And um, the book here is is about more um it, it's written in the first person as more himself and he talks about uh visiting antwerp uh in in uh uh the netherlands um so the dutch lands and um and meeting with um uh, political figures like himself, more was a, something of a, a politician, and um, he meets uh, a man who has who is obviously a, a kind of grizzled uh, sailor that's been around the world, you know, literally, and um, and this sailor begins to begins to tell more. Um, about his travels and, bef and before he gets to talking about the Americas and how he stumbled upon he and his fellow sailors uh, conquistadors uh, you know stumbled upon this island of utopia uh, before that he, he, he recounts to Moore this story of how he visited England and Moore's like, oh, you visited England, because Moore's like, you know, you're you're so 
you're such a sharp mind. You should give advice to princes, you know, you should like, like Machiavelli, right? And um, so there's a weird similarity there. And, and, um, and, and so the sailor recounts to Moore how he, he was at the uh, uh, king's court in uh, England and how it, uh, or actually, actually at the court of a, of a bishop. Um, and he recounts how, you know, they're getting into these arguments and he tried to, you know, sort of offer his advice, but then the other uh, people in the court were like shutting him down and not being open minded, you know. Um, and he just sort of starts to make some comments about what he observed in England. And one of those observations is, is, uh, is very important for us. Um, so I have this here, uh, but I do not think that this, let's search for this. All right, so, in, and this, there's not many paragraph breaks in this book, so it's it's really weird. Um, um, And so, you know, he's talking to the bishop and, and, and they're talking about, you know, um, sort of, you know, the, the bishop is expressing how, you know, you need to be ruthless, especially in warfare. You know, so it's kind of a similar theme to the prince and the prince hadn't been published yet. So Moore is thinking about this independently of the prince, but the themes are very similar. And, um, and so the sailor says, you may as well say, uh, that you must cherish thieves on account of wars, for you will never want the one as long as you have the other. And as robbers prove sometimes gallant soldiers, so soldiers often prove brave robbers. So near an alliance there is between those two sorts of life. But this bad custom, so common among you English, of keeping many servants is not peculiar to this nation. In France, there is yet a more, uh, pestiferous, uh, uh, pestiferous sort of people. For the whole country is full of soldiers, still kept up in a time of peace, if such a state of a nation can be called a peace. So they have standing armies. Um, in, the feudal time, in, feudal, in the feudal order, you didn't really have standing armies. You had knights who would, you know, uh, patrol and keep in order a small fiefdom, um, but they were just busy running the fiefdom uh, most of the time. And then when a war, when the king said, oh, we got to go to war, he would call them to council and then they would decide if they were really going to go to war because these are the people he relied on to go to war. And then if they decided to go to war, then they all went off and, and fought a, a war for a, you know, for a, a compact packed period of time. And then after the, the war was settled in some way, they all went back to their fiefdoms and went back to business. Um, but in France, you know, there, uh, Moore is pointing out, you know, in the voice of the sailor that, that they have standing armies. And if you have a standing army, is that really peace? And these are kept in pay upon the same account that you plead for those idle retainers about uh, about noblemen. Now that's what the bishop is saying is that you, you keep these people in court. And so, you know, the sailor is, is, is criticizing exactly what the bishop is doing to the bishop's face in front of his, his uh, retainers. Okay. Uh, this being a maxim of those pretended statesmen, uh, those pretended statesmen, okay, that it is necessary for the public safety to have a good body of veteran soldiers ever in readiness. They think raw men are not to be depended on, and they sometimes seek occasions for making war, and that they may train up their soldiers in the art of cutting throats 
or as Sol uh, Solist observed, for keeping their hands in use, that they may not grow dull by too long an intermission, right? If you have a standing army, then you got to keep them well trained. Best way to keep them well trained is to go to war when maybe you don't need to go to war. Okay? And, and of course, uh, we see that uh, in the United States, right? Uh, we get involved in strange conflicts like Afghanistan that seem to have no good good reason except that it it keeps the soldiers busy and keeps the money flowing for the arms manufacturers. Uh, but France has learned to uh, learn to its cost how dangerous it is to feed such beasts. The fate of the Romans, Carthaginians, and the Syrians, and many other nations and cities, which were both overturned and quite ruined by those standing armies, should make others wiser. And the folly of this maxim of the French appears plainly even from this, that their trained soldiers often find your raw men prove too hard for them, of which I will not say much, lest you think I flatter the English. So, so the English did not have a standing army, and they would call up the knights and go to war and bring peasants and artisans. And uh, often they were very successful against the French, who had a more established standing army. Um, Every day's experience shows that the mechanics in the towns or the clowns in the country are not afraid of fighting with those idle gentlemen. If they are not disabled by some misfortune in their body or dispirited by extreme want, so that you need not fear that those well-shaped and strong men, for it is only such that noblemen love to keep about them until they spoil them, who now grow feeble in the ease and are so softened with their effeminate manner of life, would be less fit for action if they were well-bred and well-employed. And it seems very unreasonable that for the prospects, uh, the prospect of a war, which you ne need never have, but when you please, uh, you should maintain so many idle men, as will always disturb you in time of peace, which is ever to be more considered than war. Okay, so it's arguments against standing armies and and and. Um, and so, and that begins to be a running theme in the entire book of Utopia. Uh, the, the people who live on the island of Utopia avoid war at all costs. Uh, but when they go to war, they, they just call up all their citizens and they go to war and they try not to, um, they try not to kill the enemy. They try to capture them, you know, so it's an idealized, you know, notion of warfare only as a last resort and being as peaceful, even in, in the conduct of war as possible. Uh, but the point is, is that that's not what's happening in Europe. That Europe is getting more and more ruthless and m more and more um, uh, enamored with the notion of going to war. And, and, and that plays out uh, uh, in the coming century. Um, there's a 30 years war that's pretty brutal and, and, um, and kind of changes the whole nature of Europe uh, just uh, decades in the future uh, from this, the writing of this book. Uh, and of course, there's the Reformation that's just about to happen or already kind of happening. <clears throat> Uh, but I do not think that this necessity of stealing arises only from hence, only from standing armies and these idle gentlemen who think of themselves as soldiers. There is another cause for it, more peculiar to England. Okay, now here is more criticizing uh, a key feature of English society at this point, a, a, a movement that was underway and was causing a lot of turmoil in, in, in the English society. What is that, said the Cardinal? The increase of pasture, said I, the sailor, by which your sheep, which are naturally mild and easily kept in order, may be said now to devour men and unpeople, uh, not only villages, but towns. For wherever it is found that the sheep of any soil yield a softer and richer wool than ordinary, there the nobility and gentry and even those holy men, the abbots, not content, uh, contented with the old rents which their farms yielded, nor thinking it enough that they, living at their ease, do no good to the public, resolve to do it hurt instead of good. They stop the course of agriculture, destroying houses and towns, 
reserving only the churches and enclosed grounds. Okay, so this is the enclosure movement. Enclosed grounds that they may lodge their sheep in there. Okay, so they enclose grounds so that they may lodge their sheep in them. As if forest and parks had swallowed up too little of the land, those worthy countrymen turned the best inhabited places into solitudes. Just sheep and a shepherd where it used to be full of serfs working the land. Um, and, and at this point, serfs were uh, mostly converted into freeholders, paying rent to the Lord and farming their own plot of land. But then the Lord decides, you know what? I can make more money selling wool to the Dutch because they, this demand for wool is just crazy. And so the price is going up and up. It's like, I could just kick, kick these peasants off my land and just deal with sheep so much easier and more money. So they start enclosing uh, the commons. Uh, and so this is the enclosure of the commons. Uh, and so they turn these best inhabited places into solitudes for when an inhabitable wretch, uh, an insatiable wretch who is a plague to his country resolves to enclose many thousands acres of ground. So they're enclosing many thousands acres of land. The owners, uh, as well as tenants, are turned out of their possessions by trick or by main force, or being being wearied out of uh, out by ill usage. They are forced to sell them. By which means those miserable people, both men and women, married and unmarried, old and young, with their poor but numerous families, since country business requires many hands. You know, if you're a farmer, having lots of children is a good thing. Uh, are, they're all forced to change their seats, not knowing whither to go. So they're just forced off the land by any means uh, at the disposal of the landlord, and they start wandering. Uh, and they must sell almost for nothing their household stuff, which changed their, uh, which could not bring them much money, even though they might stay for a buyer. When that little money is at an end, for it will be spent soon enough. Uh, what is left for them to do but either to steal and so be hanged, God knows how justly, or to go about and beg. And if they do this, they're put in prison as idle vagabonds, while they would willingly work but can find none that will hire them. For there is no more occasion for country labor to which they, uh, so no more, no more occasion for country labor to which they have been bred. When there's no arable ground left, one shepherd can look after a flock of sheep, which will stock an extent of ground that would require many hands if it were to be plowed and reaped. This likewise in many places raises the price of corn, uh, meaning wheat um, and, and bread. The price of wool is also so risen that the, the poor people who are wont to make cloth are no more able to buy it. And so small uh, crafts people who are making textiles in a cottage type industry, which is very common in England, uh, the price of wool gets so high that they can't even afford to buy the wool to continue their practice. The Dutch are, are buying up all the wool at high prices and they're flooding the market with cheap textiles. So it, it's economic warfare. Um, they're now the small cottage industry textile workers are not not able to buy the wool and this likewise makes many of them idle for since the increase of pasture god has punished the avarice of the owners by a rot amongst among the sheep which has destroyed vast numbers of them uh, to us it might have seemed more just had it fell on the owners themselves okay so there's a disease that breaks out amongst the sheep which is, is a problem when you have like industrial scale <laughs> uh, sheep herds. Um, uh, just like with cows today, you know, um, 
we raise cow in these, this factory food system that we have in the United States and, and disease is just constant and a, a constant um, thing that needs to be fought against. But suppose the sheep should increase ever so much, the price is not likely to fall, since though they cannot be called a monopoly because they are not engrossed by one person, yet they are in so few hands that these are uh, so few hands, and these are so rich that as they are not pressed to sell them sooner than they have a mind to it, so they never do it till they have raised the price as high as possible. So there's, um, you know, this landed gentry, uh, nobles who are enclosing large tracts of land, kicking the people off the land, and they're just getting richer and richer, and it's not uh, a, a, a literal monopoly, but it's it's a oligopoly. It's it's controlled by a few, and and um, and the sailor here and more is suggesting that they're running a kind of cartel, where they fix prices. And so they uh, and on the same account, it is that the other kinds of cattle are so dear because many villages being pulled down and all country labor being much neglected, there are none who make it their business to breed them. So we're just getting all sheep and no cows uh, or goats or other things, um, pigs. Um, the rich do not breed cattle as they do sheep, but they but buy them lean and at low prices. And after they have fattened them on their grounds, sell them again at high rates. So the rich are just uh, taking advantage of poor people who can't maintain their cows. They bring them onto their land, fatten them up, and then they sell them onto the next highest bidder. And so they're they're just treating uh, agriculture now in the form of raising cattle, sheep, and and cows. Uh, they're just treating it as a money making proposition, and and the people are suffering. The rich uh, do, 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 uh, high rates, and I do not think that all the inconvenience this will produce are yet observed. For as they sell the cattle dear. So if they are consumed faster than the breeding countries from which they are brought can afford them, then the stock must decrease, and this must need end in great scarcity. And by these means, this your island, which seemed as to its peculiar, uh, seemed as to this peculiar the happiest in the world, will suffer much by the crush, cursed avarice of a few persons. Besides this, the rising of corn make all people lessen their families as much as they can. And so the price of wheat is increasing and this naturally forces people to make their families smaller. And so you have, uh, you know, uh, where England used to be full of pasture land and cows and, and small farms, and seemed quite an idyllic uh, you know, way of life is now uh, just a mass of suffering people. And, and what can those who are dismissed by them do but either beg or rob? And to this last, a man of a great mind is much sooner drawn than to the former. So that they're smart, they should rob uh, because if they beg, they're going to be thrown in prison. Luxury likewise breaks in a pace upon you to set forward your poverty and misery. There's an excessive vanity in apparel and a great cost in diet. And that not only in noblemen's family, but even among tradesmen, among the farmers themselves and among all ranks of persons. You have also many infamous houses. And besides those that are known, the taverns and alehouses are no better. Add to these dice, cards, tables, football, tennis, and, and quites, in which money runs fast away, betting, and those that are initiated into them must, in the conclusion, betake themselves to robbing for a supply of money. All right, and so banish these plagues and give orders that those who have dispeopled so much soil may either rebuild the villages they have pulled down or let out their grounds to such as will do it. Um, so they should rent out their lands to people that can can bring back the villages, restrain those engrossing of the rich, those engrossings of the rich that are as bad amongst uh, as monopolies, 
E, leave fewer occasions to idleness. Let agriculture be set up again and the manufacture of wool be regulated that so there may be work found for those companies of idle people who want horses uh, to be thieves. Um, or who now being idle vagabonds or useless servants. Okay, the hiring of lots of servants because labor is cheap. Um, but do you really need so many servants? Will certainly grow thieves at last, um, these idlers and servants. If you do not find remedy to these evils, it is a vain thing to boast of your severity in punishing theft, which though it may have uh, the appearance of justice, yet in itself is neither just nor convenient. All right, and all right. So I remember now what the context was. I didn't quite remember. Um, the the cardinal was saying that um, that thieves should be punished with the death penalty, and and the sailors like the death penalty doesn't seem proportional, and that just encourages people to be more ruthless in their thievery, even to to kill their victims so that they're not a witness. Um, and then he goes into this long explanation and, and the worst kind of thievery is this land enclosure. So this is what Moore thinks of his own English society put in the mouth of this anonymous uh, fictional sailor. Um, okay, so <clears throat> land enclosure and this whole sheep business is, um, is very important. Uh, for the transition from feudalism to capitalism, especially in England, this became an issue. And Marx, um, residing in London, has this, this land enclosure movement of the 16th century, of the, of the especially exploding in the early part of the 1500s. Um, he has that clearly in mind throughout his analysis of capitalism. And, um, and, and so I'll, I'll come back to this land enclosure um, issue uh, in other videos. Okay. Um, okay, so that, that's the main thing that I wanted to, wanted to uh, talk about in regards to Moore's Utopia, uh, you know, it, it, the, the criticism and satire of, of the way things were working out in the, you know, waning days of, of feudalism um, shows how feudalism has pretty much fallen apart by this point. Uh, but then that land enclosure, the, the resort of the feudal lords to land enclosure um, is like a total negation of the feudal order because the whole the whole thing was that the land uh, that the serfs belong to the land and that that's how the feudal order operated you you uh, were uh, given a holding of land a fiefdom and then you you use the land and the people on it to um, to uh, be a good steward of the land and make it uh, prosperous for yourself and for the serfs and, and everyone else who lived on the land. But then at this point in time, the, the feudal lords start to kick the people off the land. And now it's, it's no longer feudalism. Um, and there's this, this ruthlessness in it. And now we have these people who are wandering around the country begging and stealing. And, um, and then this also uh, is something that uh, causes the cities to, to, to become, you know, not just towns, but really transform into cities. So that England becomes uh, a series of large cities with people who are in need of work and need of money somehow, but there's, there's not enough work for all the people. And part of the problem here is that um, the population uh, decline, the population decline that began in 
around 1300, 1250, 1300, and um, we had the Little Ice Age, the uh, Hundred Years War, and the Black Death, that that cut the population in half, then there was a labor shortage. And maybe that's part of the reason why the original land enclosures started taking place is because there weren't people to populate the land, right? But the population rebounded back to its levels of 1300. But now you have all these enclosures. So, so, so you can't the agriculture as it was known in 1300 no longer is as abundant you have all these sheep uh, pastures and there's no motivation for the feudal landlords to put the people back on the land because the price of wool is so high okay so um you know so there it's more gives a kind of moralistic um criticism that it's due to the avarice of these feudal lords, but we can't explain it in economic reason, uh, economic political uh, analysis. With the population decline, you have a labor shortage. There's not enough serfs to really populate all the land that was populated before. So lords starting closing it and start raising sheep um, to make use of best use of the land they can. Uh, but then as this global textile industry takes off, and even though the population is increasing, the economic incentive is for the feudal lords to retain those enclosures and keep selling wool. Okay. Um, Okay, so, but this is the total negation of the feudal order. And I should mention too, uh, just as a final note here, is that England will soon, um, in the next two centuries, uh, over the next two centuries, England will totally uh, take over the global textile market. And, um, and that's, that's uh, during the Industrial Revolution. And so the first factories, as we think of factories, um, uh, were textile factories in England. And uh, these were run by uh, water power. So they had water wheels that would, uh, large water wheels on a river. And then that, that um, dynamic motion will, will, was then fed in mechanically to textile, large uh, textile looms that were industrial size and, and mechanization and, and all these sorts of things. So the industrial revolution, as we think of it, um, is, is largely uh, about the textile industry of England and England's ability then to flood the market with very cheap textiles. And then this leads to colonization where they take over India, um, largely on the basis of destroying the indigenous textile industry in India that was uh, booming and, and they were doing a very good trade. Uh, in the 18th century, in the 1700s, the, the British Empire uh, purposely destroys that industry in, in India and then colonizes India and then um, uses India as a source of wool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. And, and uh, so that's an interesting story. All right. And very much important for understanding the rise of capitalism. So the Industrial Revolution is the rise of capitalism. Um, okay, so that's uh, what I wanted to say, and so I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye now.